The following program is presented by the Metropolitan Library Service Agency. Hello, welcome to All About Kids, a program focusing on the interests of children and young people and some of the issues affecting them. Today, Jean Holloway will moderate a panel discussion focusing on the potential impact of federal welfare reform on Minnesota's children. Ms. Holloway is an attorney with the Children's Defense Fund in Minnesota. This nonprofit group researches, educates, and advocates for children, particularly low-income minority and disabled children. She'll be joined by Hennepin County Commissioner Mark Andrew, Aviva Breen, Executive Director of the Legislative Commission on the Economic Status of Women, and Dr. Chuck Olberg, Deputy Medical Director of the Hennepin County Medical Center and a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Hello, um, we're here today to discuss the um, effect of uh, federal welfare reform on uh, Minnesota's children. And we have with us here today Aviva Breen and Mark Andrew and Chuck Olberg. Um, one of the first questions that I'd like to ask Aviva is um, we all know that the primary thrust of federal welfare reform is to eliminate the entitlement status of AFDC and to substitute uh, capped block grants. Can you explain for us what that means and what the effect is going to be for Minnesota if that goes through? Well, what the effect, it, what it means is that instead of ensuring that every, per an entitlement means that every person who qualifies under whatever the eligibility standards are, receives whatever the benefit is. A block grant means that there's a certain amount of money and when that money runs out, the next person who qualifies as eligible under all the eligibility requirements doesn't get anything because it's gone. So um, a program that's set up as a safety net to help people who are in a crisis and who need help um, ought to be an entitlement because every person who needs the help ought to get it. And what the block grant will mean is that because there will be less money. The entitlement is open-ended. We don't know till the end of a year how much it costs because we have to keep funding it until until the end of the of that year for whoever needs it and whoever is eligible. The block grant means when the money's gone, you're out of luck. You're the next person in line or you're the tenth next person in line, you're out of luck. It's gone. So what it will mean for Minnesota families is that if they're going to have a crisis, they should have it early. That's kind of a cynical way to put it, but it means that if you're the last one to have the crisis, you're not going to you're not going to get any help, and you're not going to know it beforehand because we don't plan for crises. What kinds of programs, Chuck? You were out in Washington recently. What kinds of programs that affect uh, the health of Minnesota's children are they considering um, block granting to the states? Oh, it's across the board, Jane. I mean, you can look at AFTC, which is really a cash assistance program for families. But they're talking nutrition programs for school lunches and school breakfasts. They're talking about even block granting Medicaid, which is a health insurance program for low-income children and families. So they're really talking across the board changes and how we provide services to families and children. As a director or one of the directors of the Hennepin County Medical Center, I mean, how do you foresee that impact in your practice and your work with kids and the kids in, in Hennepin County? Well, you hate to be too much of an alarmist, but I think it could be catastrophic. And I think you just have to go back to the early 1980s and some of the changes that were instituted at that point. And the changes they're talking now are actually a magnitude of tenfold, a hundredfold to what they did back then. And if you would have, uh, if you were sitting at 1980 and tried to project what the world would look like in 1995, I don't think any of us would have expected to see the ex escalation of poverty of children and just the emergence, emergence of homelessness and hunger that are facing families and kids today. And I think we're going to see the same type of ripple effect if they start to institute those changes that they're talking about now. And those have major health consequences. You know, I also think that a lot of people don't understand everybody on medical assistance um, is not necessarily starting out c at the lowest level of income. Some people oh, um, right. have what's called uh, are medically needy. That is, they have 
a low income, but they're not getting any other assistance, and then they have a medical emergency, and in order to qualify for medical assistance, they spend just about everything they have in order to qualify. So these are even families that haven't been receiving assistance and may not receive any other kinds of assistance. These are also people who are going to not be able to do that, and are also, if, if they're the next one in line after the block grant ends, they also won't be, be able to receive any help. So it isn't just one category, one stereotypical category that we have of who is receiving assistance. There's, it's a much more complex program than a lot of people realize. And many, many working families with kids. Right. This is not necessarily a welfare right. issue. This is a, a low income, middle income type exactly. of issue. How do you think, Mark, the two year cap that they're proposing on AFDC benefits in Washington is gonna affect Hennepin County? Well, it's gonna have a big effect in Hennepin County. And I think one of the things we ought to be asking ourselves and the members of Congress is why are they doing this? What is the motivation for this program? If the motivation is to cut government spending, this is not a way to do that. It is very likely that total local, state, federal mm -hmm. spending for these families and children is going to go up, not down as a result of um, the concept that's being advanced in Washington right now. So I think we really need to, we need to start questioning, I think in a very fund fundamental way, what the motivation is of the proponents of this very radical and very dangerous uh, federal policy. Um, and I don't think that's been done enough yet. Right. And I think it's going to uh, require a lot of um, grassroots support in order for us to get that message out there. What kind of costs are, is Hennepin County going to incur if, if this goes through? I mean, what kinds of particular things are you looking at that are going to impact families and kids, the costs? Well, we don't know yet exactly because we don't know exactly how, what sort of shape this thing is going to take. We're going to lose in the food and nutrition programs, in energy assistance programs, uh, in uh, AFDC programs. You know, it's, e each one of those is millions of dollars. We have uh, about 20,000 um, Hennepin County families on AFDC right now. We are expecting that uh, a small percentage of those are going to end up falling two years from now into the shelter system of the county, which is mm -hmm. all locally funded and which is very expensive. And so it, it's at this point in time, it's going to be very difficult for us to calculate precisely what the impacts um, are going to be. Um, but we know they're going to be, we know the impacts are going to fall on a less desirable form of taxation, which is property taxes. The cuts that are being made at the federal level are substantially coming out of federal income taxes paid, uh, not exclusively, but substantially. And the slack will be picked up by substantially uh, property taxes. And it has health impact as well. I mean, we have a very fine shelter program in the Twin Cities and in Hennepin County. But shelters is not the place you want to be raising your kids. And it ha again, it's going to have a ripple effect on just their health and their well-being. It's not the place we want to have our children. And school. I mean, one, right. of, one of the issues yeah. that has arisen around shelters is that we have kids in shelters. And so now we have some school programs that are located in shelters or that are connected to shelters. But these are transient kinds of programs. It's very good that we're doing that. And it's really a, 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 an excellent thing that we're doing. But it doesn't replace a stable home and a school to which, which a child attends, which they keep attending. So it provides something for the child, but it's very stopgap. And all, it also has great costs. But um, I want to go back to the question you asked Mark, to the question Mark asked, which is what is the motivation? Because I, th I think the motivation is not to help families, but to change behavior. And, mm. and I don't think it takes into account children. I hear so much discussion of it being changing the behavior of parents who are not behaving the way we think they ought to. And perhaps they aren't. That, that is a, a question and an issue and all kinds of things. But I, I don't hear discussion about the children and the impact on children. And I think we are using it to change be I think it is being used, I shouldn't say we. I think it's being used to change behavior, but I don't think the impact on children is really being weighed the same way. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you say I don't think the impact on children is being weighed in the same way the desire to change the behavior of adults is being weighed. So we're, they're taking steps that are going to have massive impacts on kids while they're trying to change the behavior of the parents and without really any 
sort of fundamental understanding or consensus that it's really going to change the behavior of and, the parents. And I think that one of the really disturbing things to me in this whole discussion is that I think there is a strong indication that some of the advocates for this legislation in Washington are doing this with impunity. There is a, a snarling nastiness to um, to the rationale that's been stated on the, particularly the floor of the House of Representatives. Um, Congressman Livingston making the comment uh, that I've had enough of this um, compassion garbage. It's time for us Oof, to get on with the business strong. of cutting programs. Um, these kinds of inflammatory comments, I think, are very indicative of a mentality that is a prevailing ethic in Washington right now. And if, if that mentality was not there, there would be some effort to provide some basic support services for the people who are scheduled to be cut off these programs. I think one of the really uh, disconcerting things um, about this whole effort is that what we're talking about with these block grants represents an absolute reduction mm -hmm. in uh, government support for fundamental programs around job training, around child care subsidies, uh, around getting people into the job market, um, around education. And that, I think, is really very disturbing. I could understand um, the government in fact, I support welfare reform that attaches mutual expectations that demand that the clients in our programs are expected to better themselves if they are able to do that, to get themselves out of the crisis with some government assistance. And, uh, and I think that's fair. And I think it's also fair for recipients of these programs to expect that the government, if we are going to be imposing these kinds of expectations, on people that we provide fundamental support services, transportation assistance, medical uh, assistance, uh, child care assistance, uh, some job training, and certainly um, a crack at decent uh, education before we end up just making wholesale cuts in the programs. Um, the other piece that really, I think, bothers me as a policymaker is the complete denial that there are jobs out there for these um, people and self-sustaining uh, employment opportunities. There are not self-sustaining employment opportunities for the vast majority of the people who are going to be uh, getting cut off these programs. And there has been precious little discussion at either the federal level or the state level. I mean, don't get me started on our own state welfare reform <laughs> uh, efforts because we're not uh, we're not exactly generations ahead of the of the feds on this one. There is uh, virtually no attention that's been paid to the issue of the marketplace and the availability of jobs and livable wage jobs. And the yeah, that's, of that's so things. well said. If you really want welfare reform and want to address the issue of poverty. We need to talk about education and we need to talk about an affordable wage. There's families in this country and in Minnesota who can work full time, full year, and still not make enough to rise above the federal poverty level. I think that's where you're going to find your real welfare reform is going to be when you start to address those issues of education and adequate wage. Well, you were recently out in Washington. You were talking to legislators. You said sure. that to educate them on some of these issues that affect kids and their health concerns. Why do you think that these, that it's all this information is just being disregarded. I was surprised. I, was, I went out there and I was a bit skeptical because I thought, <laughs> you know, what am I going to find with this major change that's happened since November? And there are so many new legislators and so many new staff personnel out there that many of them really don't understand the impact of many of the changes that they're talking about. They don't think about what the ripple effect or what the consequence is going to be for families and particularly children. That's they true. just don't have that information. Even on the policy committees. Yes. On Even on the policy oh, yes, committees. I there think, is I an think incredible mm -hmm. Met with the staffer from Ways and Means, which is really the major task committee and one of the major public policy and health committees on the House of Representatives. And this person had been on, on the Hill for maybe two or three months and didn't have a clue to what we were talking about when we started talking about uh, consequences for children. But I think there's been so much rhetoric and there's been so much stereotyping that it's been adopted without going beyond, um, beyond digging deep to find out f to find out what's there. For example, at, the, at our state legislature we had testimony on the welfare reform bill and I was thinking about the two-year cutoff or the 
proposal at the state level to require someone who applies to immediately do a job search instead of receiving any benefits. And the first person who got up to testify was a woman who um, was in the hospital having her second child when her husband told her he was leaving her. And there she was in the hospital bringing, about to bring home a baby to, and another baby at home and no way even to get home from the hospital. Um, and it, it was such a glaring example. One size does not fit all. One set of criteria that are very punitive do not fit every situation. This person doesn't fit into the proposal at the state level to immediately do a job search when she's coming home from having a baby. She doesn't fit into some other stereotype. Um, and there's no flexibility because there's no real understanding of the individual people. Everybody knows some example of somebody who has figured out a way to beat the system or somebody whose behavior we don't like and we don't approve of and therefore we don't want to give government assistance to. But there's a whole gamut of people and, and we, need, we need to have a system that looks at it, the needs of individuals and tries to fix them instead of setting up a system because somebody did something we didn't like. What are the kinds of information that you're giving to legislators out in Washington about the effect of this reform on the kids? Well, as a pediatrician, you tend to focus on, on the health issues. And again, if we just look at what's happened over the last decade or so, we've seen just an explosion of preventable illnesses that we thought at one point we had taken care of. Measles, in, in 1980, there were only 2,700 cases of measles in the country. By 1990, we were up to 27,000 cases. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a preventable disease that you know, if a child gets, can have some very serious consequences. Tuberculosis, there's a reemergence of TB and predominantly among low-income families. And at Hennepin County Medical Center, just in the last year, I've had four or five kids that I've seen or are aware of who have had tuberculosis, a plague that we thought we had eliminated probably 15 years ago. And it gets back to access to basic health services and to care for kids. And it just shouldn't be happening. And if they put these cuts in place, we're going to see those type of problems only magnified. And you're providing this information to the legislators. What's their reaction? I mean, well, again, I was I was surprised. They, they appeared to be receptive. They appeared to want to have the information. Now, whether or not they mm -hmm. take that information and then incorporate it into policy, I think is yet to be seen. Mm -hmm. well, you know, a long time ago, we had the th or when actually when welfare programs first developed, we had the concept of the deserving poor and the uh, and the, right. the worthy poor, the non-worthy poor. It almost feels like that's what's coming back. Everybody wants to help those families whose situation you describe that are sympathetic, that have right. um, come into difficulties not through no cause of their own, and they have, have behaved the way we think they ought to behave. And, and we want to help those. And I, no matter who you talk to who's a government policymaker, they might agree that they want to help those people. So there's almost a desire to say we want to pick and choose. We don't want an entitlement because then everybody can get it. And we only want to help the people who's whose situations we think are deserving of it. And I, I, think, that's, I think that's very frightening. Uh, In reality, children really should be a, a nonpartisan issue. And when you talk one-on-one -on -one with legislators, I think both at the state and federal level, they, they understand that. I think sometimes, I think as Mark said, we get wrapped up in the rhetoric at times. And we, we, we fail to really look to see the things that, that, that we're doing. One of the um, driving forces, at least they say, behind federal welfare reform is to push decisions to the local level, to allow the counties or the state governments to experiment. Is Hennepin County now doing something, Mark, in terms of experimenting with new ideas, either in response to the changes that are coming down from Washington or in other areas? To Yeah, but I'd, I'd, I would not say it's being done necessarily in response to what's happening in Washington now. We, at the local level, I think, are um, in a better position uh, to um, to generate new uh, innovations in the delivery of services because we're the ones who deliver the services. And so you get to the state legislature and you're an order of abstraction removed from reality. <laughs> and you get to, you get to Washington, D.C., you might as well be on Mars. <laughs> and, I mean, they don't have... A, That's really the truth now. Know, <laughs> they, they don't have a clue. And so even at the county commissioner level in Hennepin County, where we know we have many thousands of cases, roughly 13% of the population of our county is on our caseload at any given point in time, that's about 130, over 130,000 citizens in our county, uh, it's even hard for county board members to get close enough to what's happening on the streets to really have a clear understanding of, of that. But in, in general terms, 
um, we have pioneered, I think, several uh, different models in social programming that I think are more commonly accepted uh, than they were a few years ago. Certainly the issue of redesigning uh, services uh, to be responsive to clients that are more holistic is something that we've been doing for some number of years now and that's taken on some credibility with other uh, levels of government now and with our clients uh, and we're doing a lot more of that. Uh, moving services upstream, for instance, just to pick a random example, uh, in Hennepin County's foster care program and child welfare programs, we spend um, a lot more of our resources now um, trying to keep kids from getting removed from their homes in the first place. Um, because it's a lose-lose situation when you get a kid pulled out of a home, placed into foster care, the child's being damaged, um, the family is being disintegrated by, the, by a government action, and it's tremendously expensive. And so um, we're trying to figure out ways to, to keep the families together and then apply in a very strategic way services that uh, get at every aspect of what's causing that family to melt down. Is it chemical dependency? Is it, is it neglect or abuse? Is there a sexuality uh, issue involved that's inappropriate um, or deviant? Um, what are the factors that are causing this family to, to uh, be in trouble? And we're trying to apply that kind of a model in welfare reform, very much so mm -hmm. in welfare reform. So the kinds of things we would like to see at the local level is an emphasis taken off administrative costs. That's where the growth is in costs. The federal government wants to save money. Let's tell them to eliminate a lot of the nonsense they're imposing on us. I was just going um, to comment on that. I think that's the that's positive a big ticket deal, and, and that's actually the positive part of welfare reform. And I, and I don't want to be negative about, about everything that's being proposed. One of the things you do at the state level or at the county level is trying to get is try to get around some of the regulations that limit what you can do to help families or that you that stand in the way. And there's lots of them federally. So, getting rid of a lot of those is a positive. Um, and I think where I worry is I'd like to see some minimum standards. I'd, I wouldn't like the Fed saying, you can have this money to do what you want, but you must do these things. But I'd, I'd rather have them saying, this is the minimum that you must do so that right. we ensure that there really is a minimum. But I, there are lots of federal bureaucratic rules that our state spends a lot of money trying to get the feds to waive so they can do something that is creative or something that is different that, that we feel that will, will help families. So that part of reform is very, very good and, that and is badly good. needed. And, and I totally agree with that. The issue of establishing minimum federal standards I think is a very important notion. The public wants to get some of the administration and overburden out of the federal government and down to the states and to the local level. And I think most reasonable people agree with that mm -hmm. as a good goal. The problem is, is what's happening in Congress is they're totally abrogating any role or responsibility for the federal government and redefining the whole concept of federalism. And there needs to be a fundamental minimum standard there in welfare uh, in terms of grant right. levels, in terms of the right. programs that have to be carried out for every state. And I will say this, uh, that in Minnesota, if that does not happen, and people like Senator Grahams and other people in our congressional delegation support just cutting the federal government out of an active role in these programs, we are going to experience in high quality of life states like Minnesota massive in-migration mm -hmm. of people coming here from poorer parts of the country like Mississippi and Alabama to take advantage of our job market and to take advantage of the more um, humane programs that we have here. And so that's going to be a whole other problem if we don't have those minimum standards that Aviva refers to. Could you just talk a little bit about MFIP and how that mm -hmm. interplays with, with the federal welfare reform? And we were talking about you know, getting waivers from federal mm -hmm. rules and stuff. Well, MFIP, which is the Minnesota Family Investment Program, is Minnesota's welfare reform. We're actually doing welfare reform, and, and we've been, um, it, it's almost a year now that we've been engaged in it. And a lot of what our welfare reform program is involved getting waivers from the federal government to allow us to experiment with a program that encouraged families to stay together encourages them to work and allows them to keep more of the money they earn. And that's one of the biggest limitations in the federal welfare program is as soon as you start earning money, getting into jobs, which is what we want people to do, you start losing your grant. So you never get a chance to quite get off your feet before you lose your grant and don't need it anymore. 
family investment program um, allows families to start doing this on their own if they don't have enough um, ability to do that on their own, get help with case management to start planning, um, getting education if they need it, getting job training if they need it, getting job search skills if they need it, and then keeping more of their money as they earn it. So they're essentially working their way off the grant. The more they earn, the less their grant is, but it goes a little longer than, than the grant does now, so they really get a chance to work their way off. And a lot of the time and money in getting that program set up was spent getting the feds to waive all kinds of rules and regulations in order to allow us to do it. Um, so, but it's a, a limited, it's a limited study. There are only 6,000 families in the state that are in it, and it was a random selection. Those lucky enough to get in it are really going to benefit and, and get a lot of opportunity at the same time. So we're already doing welfare reform, as are many states. Um, I think ours is a very enlightened and very uh, progressive and very positive welfare reform for families, and, and I think I'd like to see us focus more on it. Um, our state legislature is considering expanding it, and even though there are some costs, there might be a thousand more families that'll benefit, and that would be really exciting if they could. Oh. There's, you know, there's another success story in Minnesota, too, which is really health reform that links to welfare mm -hmm. reform. Yes. And it's a nice example of how you can bl blend federal, state, and county programs. You can take uh, between medical assistance at the federal level, Minnesota care at the state level, and assured care, which is a Hennepin County health care program for families. We've essentially eliminated uh, uncovered children from the state that, in fact, I heard recently that we're down to about 1% of kids in Minnesota who don't have health care coverage. It's a wonderful example mm -hmm. that if you really put your mind to it, you can create a system that blends federal, state, and county programs to really do what you want it to do. And in fact, I think we have data that show that, I, I, I don't want to quote the numbers wrong, I want to say 1,800 families a month. Oh, it was the 2,400 2,400 families. 2,400 families a month who are not on AFDC because they are receiving Minnesota right. care, and that's documented. Now that is... A wonderful That's real state. welfare yes, reform. that is welfare reform. Yeah. These families are not on AFDC anymore yeah. because they have health care. And that, it's, it's terrific. And that gets to the essence of what I was trying to say before about the holistic approach mm -hmm. that I think is the long-term answer in health care reform, welfare reform, um, innovative social programming. Uh, that we're starting to make a connection here that part of the solution to the welfare problem is an improved health care right. system. Mm -hmm. And as we go along, we're going to continue to make connections that uh, will show us that part of the way to reduce jail populations, for instance, is through the schools mm -hmm. and reducing truancy and better educational um, options. And all of these um, systems, I think, are, are inextricably linked together. And the solution to the problems, I think, is going to come from all of those systems. Yeah, and child care is a big piece that fits oh, yes. in there too. Huge it's issue. A, and Major. that's mm -hmm. a, yes, with a with a substantial amount of funding for that, you can keep a number of families off of welfare. That's part of the MFIP piece too, isn't yes, it? Yes, it's it's part of the MFIP piece. It guarantees that while you're on and and um, for a year after you go off AFDC, you're you are able to have your child care subsidized. But the more you earn, the more you pay toward your child care. So it's not a complete subsidy. I'm very concerned about um, just thinking about nutrition issues because we haven't talked a great deal about mm -hmm. nutrition. But block writing, lunch programs, breakfast programs, the WIC program, I think is, could be devastating in this, at the state level. Right. And uh, you just look at the number of families having to use food shelves right now. I think last year, 1.2 million families had to use food shelves to help supplement their nutrition. Mm -hmm. Two thirds mm -hmm. of them had children in those families. You know, you just kind of see the effects over and over again. And if you want to do it right, we should look to some of the programs that we've talked about on how you can blend right. the programs more appropriately. Well, I'd like to go on with this conversation forever. I'm sure we could, but uh, our time is up and we need to wrap up. And thanks for all participating. It was very nice. Thank you. Thank you. An in-depth, provocative, and realistic look at the potential impact of federal welfare reform. Thank you, Jean Holloway. Thank you, Hennepin County Commissioner Mark Andrew. Aviva Breen and Dr. Chuck Olberg. Thanks to all of you for joining us on All About Kids. Please tune in again.